step over here for one moment and do probably one of the uh, freakiest things you guys are going to see on the tour here is I'm going to remove a puppet's face. <laughs> so how we animate faces is... Okay, we're at Leica Studios. Stop motion animation, their new movie, Missing Link. They told us we can touch, so here I am touching. Character of Adelina in Missing Link. Voiced by Zoe Saldana. Make everything movable. How cool is that? Usually we can't touch, but today we're left. Here's Jackman, this is this guy. see how this feeds back into the Errol O'Kane illustrations of how he went about developing his suit. So it looks like a straight plaid on him here, but it's actually drawn out oh, around the shape and around the contours yes. of his body. That's interesting. Because otherwise we'd have so many darts and seams all over the place, you really, really can't do it. So mm -hmm. to keep that smooth essence, but to keep this flavor in there. Mm -hmm. And again, working with the colors and the texture again, this wow. is how we would have to do it. You can see up here, this is um, a, a used version of his pants shape here. It's pretty involved. So with all these lines, everything gets moved around incrementally until it fits and works together. And you can see as well, like he, he stole this suit from the Pacific Northwest bar <laughs> brawl, which I think you guys have just seen. <laughs> yeah. um, you can see how pinched it is around his body. And to get that effect, we work with digital stitching. So we would draw that out and then program it into a sewing machine and do different versions of it. So it's actually made flat, uh -huh. as you can see up here, but putting the tufts through and working mm -hmm. with the, the shape of the sh um, shirt underneath, it looks really tall on his body and like it doesn't fit him. It's pinched up under his arms. It's a little short, it's too short here. Um, all of those things give that kind of comedic effect to him looking kind of clunky in his suit and a little uncomfortable, like it's not his. Yeah. Talked to a costume designer, they said they make a rig the outfit so that you can move him, like so, say if they're in the wind, it stays. See? How cool is that? They told us we can touch, so I'm touching. Into the hands, arms. Wow, look at that. It's rigging. It's all rigging. Explain how this works. Here's the rigging. Moving parts from inside. Okay, they said the hands are made of wires, they break easily. No, I'm not going to touch that. But this is the rigging inside this guy. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the rest of Link and what he's made of. Um, it's primarily silicon. Um, we use uh, two types of silicon. Uh, this is he's pretty much tin silicon uh, throughout. And the reason is that um, you know the, these these characters once they're down on stages, they really they really they really get quite a battering. You know, as sophisticated as they are, as delicate as they are, well, they're not delicate, but I mean. They're robust to a point and durable. We have about 14 people that maintain the puppets uh, for animation. Um, this material will rip, it will tear, and it's constantly being um, repaired. And what we find with tin, silicon, it's, 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 it's very accessible, it's very fast to repair, we can do repairs on stages. That said, we are moving into uh, more platinum silicons. We, have a, we actually have a puppet hospital. It's yeah. legitimately yeah, called it literally the puppet is. hospital. <laughs> so we've got yeah. the fabrication team upstairs, everything. downstairs. We've just extended the puppet hospital because it's kind of literally like a rapid response yeah. unit because time is our biggest commodity. Yeah. Animators' time because it takes so long to, to animate. So, yeah, we've got, they haven't got flashing lights, but that could be. <laughs> well, they built some li we built some little gurneys for the puppets for a giant, which is pretty funny. Anyway. So, yeah, he's primarily um, uh, silicon. I mean, his interior. And like we were talking about that shape and maintaining that shape um, before. Inside here, if I could slice him open or pull this skin off, he's got a, uh, uh, 
a foam interior that's a different foam softness. This is also, it looks a little bit like a pineapple with these concentric sort of diamonds placed next to each other and sliced through. And what it meant was that when he expands, it kind of keeps his form when he tips, it holds rather than buckles. Um, something else really cool about him, um, as far as fur is concerned, I mean, achieving fur in a, a stop motion character is, is, is quite the thing. Um, something that we don't, uh, that we don't enjoy here, we don't encourage and we don't, we don't have in our films is, um, is boil and crawl. I don't know if anyone knows what that is exactly. Well, if you look at say maybe a more pu sort of purist stop motion films like Isle of Dogs for example is a good example. You go back to King Kong or Ray Harryhausen, you see that kind of scatter on the surface of, of the puppets, whether it's hair or other things. Um, so we needed to create something that would break like fur, like here you see his neck moving, and you've got that depth, everything moving over itself, um, without that flick, without that scatter. So this uh, cow is, uh, is not silicon, it's made of urethane, uh, which is a, is a material that you, you probably find in your uh, car dashboard, for example. We use a lot of urethanes because we can vary the softness of urethanes from quite a gummy uh, material to something that's very solid. This is the same as this, only this has got a soft one. And so this is a really neat uh, piece of um, uh, soft engineering, really. It's quite, a, it's quite a thing, it took a while to get to. It's got a beautiful concentric foam core. This is rough. Uh, we made about 26 of these, have been pulled off a puppet, so it's been well used. But you can see how it slides without any scatter. I'm gonna step over here for one moment and do probably one of the uh, freakiest things you guys are gonna see on the tour here is I'm gonna remove a puppet's face. <laughs> so how we animate faces is we actually uh, use a technique called 3D, or excuse me, a technique called replacement animation. And replacement animation is not new. It's been around for probably over 100 years. Um, replacement animation, most of you guys have probably seen Jack Skellington from yes. Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm -hmm. yes. He was a replacement animated character. Uh, his faces, his heads were hand sculpted. Uh, there was about 800 of them that were sculpted for the entire film and they were popped on and popped off. So replacement animation is something that Leica has used since Coraline, but we've done it a little bit differently. We have uh, taken advantage of some new emerging technology, which are 3D printers. And we have, instead of hand sculpting different facial expressions, we are modeling them in the computer and then we're 3D printing out the geometry of the faces. So, Lionel here is full color 3D printed. Um, again, we started doing this on Coraline, Paranorman, Box Trolls, Kubo and the Two Strings. I'm assuming you guys have seen those films mm -hmm. or at least some of them. Uh, all of those, most of those characters' faces were done with 3D printed replacement animation. So, we love magnets. We buy them by the hundreds of thousands from China. Each face has their own magnets in it, so the animator drops a face on. Uh, when they're out on set, they have a literally a box of faces and an X sheet, and that X sheet is telling them exactly what frame they need to replace a face and put on another expression. That X sheet is based on a facial performance that we have worked on in the rapid prototyping department for sometimes months. We are doing that facial performance in the computer. We're presenting that to the directors. The director is listening to that facial performance or giving us acting notes. They say, ah, I want the character to smile at the end or no, he's got to hold that frown a little bit longer. We'll go back into the computer, adjust that facial performance until the director's happy with it. And once he's happy with it, we take that facial performance. We then export the faces that are in there as geometry and send them to one of these fancy 3D printers. Uh, we also then take that facial performance and break it down on a frame by frame basis and that we print out an X sheet which is sort of giving the animator the blueprints of knowing when they need to swap out faces. But so when they're out on set they are moving the character around, they're getting the clothes just right, they're getting the head just right and it comes time for uh, a subtle move in the face they'll replace it with another facial expression. So the animator is also taking an X-Acto blade and they are it's really unnerving to watch. This is probably the second freakiest thing you guys are going to see on the tour. But they're stabbing the eyeball with an X-Acto blade. And I drank a little bit too much coffee this morning, so I'm a little shaky. And they're also moving the lid around. Okay. 
and they're getting that that lid and that eye line just right and then they're putting I made them look drunk and cross-eyed but <laughs> I'm not an animator and then they're so they're doing the eye line and they're getting that performance of the eyeballs and the eyelids so this is for missing link we actually were printing a yellow support material so this support material if you guys can see is just sort of like a weird jello it's gelatinous you peel it away and as you peel it away you're left with the hard model on the inside so you can kind of see that if I were to scrape through this surface there is uh, the hard plastic inside there it's really fun to remove the support material you go into these water blasters that spray out a really high pressure water and you feel like the world's fastest sculptor because suddenly you're spraying something and you're revealing a really beautiful object Ooh. underneath so the, the printers are really accurate uh, as far as the surface quality they're very smooth so for the first time ever we actually didn't need to sand faces on previous productions on previous iterations of 3d printed we always had to sort of give a fine sand to them to remove any build layers because again these are made up of thousands of different layers and sometimes you could just see the striations but with this technology over 90% of the faces on Missing Link, we didn't need to sand. This is a really great example of a scene from the movie where Mr. Lint was fighting with a Nessie creature. So we're gonna comp Mr. Lint into a scene with, you know, um, with waves and with a Nessie and a boat and things like that. But this is the rig that we used for that scene. We give the animators the incremental control through a series of winders and tracks this is built on an XYZ Cartesian system, so that it's kind of like a big Etch-a-Sketch where the uh, animator can kind of place the puppet anywhere in space. And then they can go in and then they can perform with pretty much very steady accuracy the performance on top of the rig like so. Here we have XYZ Cartesian with rotation here and then rotation here and very often we've got these series of ball joints which are very similar to the ones that you see inside the puppet just only bigger to carry the puppet around. You'll see that there's a lot of kind of mechanism here that you don't see in the final film that's because all our work gets painted out in post which is kind of a blessing and a shame. Same, <laughs> same breath. This is um, the Rigging department get involved with a lot of the kind of the specials we call them. They're kind of the insert shots, they're the kind of the overscale. This is our first and probably last 300% butt piece that we've ever produced in the studio. <laughs> um, so this is Mr. Lent, he's bending down and his, his, uh, his pants split open. So this is a special created for that. You can see that all the fabric is rigged on the very similar winder systems that we rigged to the puppets to give the animator incre incremental control as they're peeling those uh, those panels away and then they have the ability to move the butt piece into position through hit this winder back here and then get some follow through on the fur here so the fur is armatured so they can move and they can get that kind of like follow through there and these tennis balls those are just to keep the animators eyes safe um, we do a lot of these kind of close-ups, so all our hands are kind of like 200% versions that we can kind of, um, so we can punch in and we don't kill the scale like in things like brush strokes or anything like that punch. Um, we have Aldo Yeti. Now Aldo Yeti was an interesting puppet, you couldn't see her legs. Um, this was a special sculpt that was produced just for her to sit down. As you can see, the animator wasn't able to get in there and actually push the knees and the um, the thighs around so she's more or less completely controlled externally. It's
built many of these wounds. You know, we built about uh, seven, seven units worth of this uh, set. And this is all set up right now. It's partially for display, but also this is how we would start out on a unit, meaning we would try to shoot the largest uh, establishing shot, and then we will break this all apart. There's, you know, probably 60 tables under here that all come apart in different configurations leaving a channel for the animator to get to the puppets at times and then it breaks apart and goes to different units so um it's the way and it's the, all the flaws of physics i mean i'm so in awe of animators and the tail and keeping on track of it in, in some respects, you look at that shot and think, great, we've got a bit of a save because we're not seeing the facial performance, so we can save a whole. It's got one face in it, no problem at all. But then you get into the complexities of how the horse moves. Oh, the muscle, because it, yeah. the, ho the horse is a, is a, a set and a, and a puppet in this, and how he moves compared to Lionel. So anytime you've got two puppets holding on to each other, it com it, the complexity for the animator grows immensely. Mm. So that, again, this was probably like two seconds a week realistically because of these horse shots, because they're too animating as one. This is this is what would be described to, to me more of an average size of a set for a stop motion film. Um, okay. Yeah, no, please. It's like it, looks, it looks so real. Look at that. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. The lighting. Like the video. lighting. Okay. Yeah, the lighting. Yeah. It's all lighting. Lighting is amazing. Yeah, well that's, I mean, listen, you know, I, I've worked in computer, I've, live action theater this this kind of work and to me there's nothing quite like light flying against an object on film. Mm -hmm. it's it's they can simulate it in computer and we do it here and I, I love that too it's it's get the tools are getting so but to be able to walk in and actually get sort of hit by the what you're looking at and the, the actual objects lit with light is to me it's beautiful it's beautiful exactly